Okay, welcome everybody to day two of the fourth annual U.S. Space Command Legal Conference, presented in partnership with the Air Force Academy's Law, Technology, and Warfare Research Cell. Once again, could we get a round of applause for this morning's refreshments provided by the University of Nebraska's College of Law? Again, we really do appreciate our co-sponsors and all the support that you provide to make this event uh, what it is. A couple notes before we get started with our first session today. We'll be operating on the same schedule with five and one minute warnings coming out of the breaks. Again, if there are any emergencies, fire alarm or the like, please exit through the rear of the facility and then cut through Arnold Hall into the parking lot. We'll all gather in the parking lot. There will again be a no host happy hour at half at the conclusion of today at about 1630. Um, I understand there was a bit of a snafu with the food trucks yesterday. Apparently, uh, at least one of them caught on fire while it was driving up. <laughs> and so it had to be, uh, everybody was okay. Nothing uh, major happened, but they had to tow it away. Um, so they'll be providing a different food truck for today. So apologies if that caused any delays for anybody getting lunch yesterday. Um, one note, we are the, uh, all graduates of McGill University. If you wouldn't mind at the first break today, coming up on stage, uh, they would like to do a photo with all the McGill graduates. So I'll provide another reminder of that before we go into our first break. Um, and as another reminder, um, unless otherwise indicated, the presentations and opinions of all today's speaker remain their opinions alone and do not necessarily reflect the opinion of the U.S. government, DOD, Space Command, USAFA, the Air Force, or their respective organizations. With that out of the way, I would like to introduce our keynote speaker for this morning, Dr. Pippa Malmgren. She will present on the future of space exploration, space operations, and geopolitical impacts on world economy. Dr. Malmgren is an economist who makes sense of the world economy by writing books, founding tech businesses, advising policymakers around the world, and through public speaking and teaching. She lectures at Sandhurst, the Royal, Defense, or Royal College of Defense Studies, and in the Duke Global Executive MBA program. She is a founding member of Lunark, a project designed to ensure the first human institution on the moon represents the arts and humanities. She served President George W. Bush in the White House as a special assistant to the president and on the National Economic Council. After 9-11, she was responsible for assessing terrorism risk to the economy and technology as a source of geopolitical competitiveness. She has a BA from Mount Vernon College and a PhD from the LSE. Thank, um, thank you for joining us, Dr. Malmgrim, and I turn the floor over to you. Great, thank you so much. <laughs> So I want to talk today about the story of space. Most of you are focused on the details and particularly the legal details, but I want to go to the bigger picture and talk about where we really are. So our story right now is we are at war. Uh, we have conflict in Ukraine, we have in the Middle East, but actually space has been at the heart of the war we're really in. Some 50 days before the Russian tanks rolled into Ukraine, we had an extraordinary incident on a tiny island called Svalbard that most of you will be familiar with, but most people don't know where it is, inside the Arctic Circle in Norway. Someone cut what is the fastest internet cable in the world. They took away about, now I've been living in Europe too long, I'm gonna say six kilometers, uh, they took it away, cut it both ends, took it away. Now, first of all, what is the fastest internet cable in the world doing in the middle of nowhere in the Arctic? Answer, virtually every satellite, low altitude certainly, depends on the connection to Earth at Svalbard. You cut that cable, and what you put at risk is potentially missile guidance. Definitely, we depend on SatNav for Uber Eats, right? For DoorDash, that gets people's attention. Luckily, we had huge redundancy built in, and so nothing went down. But the British chief of the defense forces came straight out and said, this would be normally considered an act of war. Front page, 
of the Daily Mail, the most widely read publication in the world today in the English language. And then it disappeared. And why did it disappear? Because we didn't really want to announce that we were directly in conflict with who we suspected did it. But that was the beginning of a new kind of warfare, which also tied from satellites to the global subsea cable networks. And we've had nothing but subsea cable warfare since, not only with one superpower, but it seems two. And so space has been central to the actual conflict that we're in. And it's brought back some memories of the old days of the Cold War. Do any of you remember the Duke Gap? You have to be a certain age to remember the Duke Gap. The Greenland, Iceland, UK Gap. This space between Greenland, Iceland and the north of the United Kingdom. Not so long ago, maybe six months ago, somebody cut the cable, the internet cable between the Scottish Shetland Islands in the very north of the United Kingdom and uh, the Danish Faroe Islands. Now, first you look at it and you say, who cares? I mean, what have they got up there? It's a bunch of sheep, right? But we're in a moment in history where we have a superpower threatening to use nuclear weapons, potentially nuclear weapons on submarines. And what would be one of the most critical locations for tracking this, that would be this gap. And therefore that cable has tremendous strategic significance in our time. And so space and subsea cables are almost one huge unit. And all this takes us to a notion that we're not just at war in Ukraine and in Gaza. We are in a war that's kind of everywhere. And I have described it as we're in a hot war in cold places. Those cold places are space, the open oceans above and below the surface, and particularly in the north, I would say from the Baltic Sea north. These have all become huge hotspots from a strategic security point of view. These, by the way, are all places where there are no journalists, where most of what happens is classified. So most of the public have no idea that there's anything happening in these locations. I would also argue we're in a cold war in hot places. We are jockeying with other superpowers for influence and physical positions all through the Pacific. Um, General Milley has said it's an underreported military buildup that's occurring in the Pacific. As we'll see, part of that is about establishing footholds on Pacific islands for the purposes of space and satellite management. Also in Africa, we have all kinds of conflict and jockeying going around various parts of Africa, and of course, the South China Sea. So when we talk about situational awareness, the media tells us the focus is Ukraine and the Middle East. But we can't afford to take that view just because that happens to be where the journalist and the photo ops are. There are no photo ops of what I'm describing, but they're critically important to our understanding of the future. And the future is space. So now we step back and try to understand why. Why are we going into space? It's important because having worked in the White House, I gotta tell you, President is not going to be listening to all your details about the legal framework for this. He's going to want the story. And I don't mean this particular president. I mean any president, right? Any president's going to know, what's our story? What's the story the public can engage with and get behind? That is the task of what we want to talk about today. How are we going to explain this to the president? So number one, when we look at the course of human history, there are two technologies for imposing order on all the chaos of information out there. One is numbers and the other is stories. Stories are vastly more powerful than numbers. So the quality of the story we tell will really matter. People remember stories, they don't remember numbers. So, we are literally at a once in a species moment. 
because we're not going back to the moon to step on it. We're going back to stay. We're going back to build. Most people think this is a billionaire's playground. This is a bunch of overgrown kids who are spending their billions playing around in space. That is not the story. The real story is this is an existential race for some very specific things. Unlimited energy, unlimited resources, unlimited internet connectivity, unlimited computational power, and entirely new physics. These are enormous prizes, and it will matter who gets there first. And everybody's trying to get there first, as we heard yesterday. So let me just quickly explain, what do I mean by these things? Well, number one, the prospect of unlimited energy comes from the fact that both Caltech and Airbus have now proven we can put sophisticated mirrors on satellites, catch the sun's rays, convert them into radio waves, and beam them back to Earth safely to have unlimited power in any electricity grid anywhere in the world. The Saudis are already backing the British on the North Sea test project. Why? Because the Saudis have realized if this works, our oil and gas is not going to be worth very much, certainly not what it's been worth in the past. So this is a game changer for the world economy. We are also going into space to help build stars on Earth. Nuclear fusion is making incredible advances. Huge amounts of capital are coming in behind it now, I think. The Commonwealth Project just got backed by Bill Gates and Jeff Bezos. They've raised like five billion, and there will be more. I'm personally working on one of these nuclear fusion projects. But effectively what it is, is a star on Earth. To do nuclear fusion, one of the things you need is helium-3. And where do we find that? Turns out a lot of it's on the moon. But we're also trying to build stars on the moon. <clears throat> Already we have discussions about Rolls-Royce small nuclear reactors, GE as well, being placed on the lunar surface. So building stars on Earth and building stars on the moon that are a source of potentially unlimited, cheap, clean, green energy. That is a prize that the President of the United States and the public can understand. We're also going into space to begin this process that sounds so science fiction, but it is already here, and that is asteroid mining. Now that's harder to explain to people, so I'm gonna put it in really simple terms. There is one single asteroid called Psyche. Have any of you guys heard about Psyche? You know the Psyche mission. Okay, so the Psyche mission from NASA just went up a couple months ago. Why are we going to Psyche? They say, that the value of the assets on Psyche, the iron ore, the gold, potentially also the lithium, the cobalt, all of it is worth $10 quintillion. Now, nobody understands what the heck is $10 quintillion, right? They can't even make sense of that. So let's put it a different way. If you were to distribute the value of Psyche to every single human being on earth, everyone would be a billionaire. Now that's a story. That is a world where we can build fighter jets and iPhones and MRI scanners with a supply chain from space, thus eliminating dependence on any earthbound sources of the raw materials that we might need for these things, an issue that we've all been looking at, I'm sure, quite closely. Also, what I'm describing is a world where we don't have to dig earth up anymore to get the stuff we need to make high tech. That's a very interesting story. And what I'm describing is a world where this new supply chain of space becomes inherent and integral to every single transaction that happens on Earth. Unlimited energy, unlimited resources, that's an equation that makes sense for the world economy. And I can see I'll have to click these twice to get the uh, video to go. <laughs> So what I'm describing is a world where many things are happening that are initially hard to understand. And one of them is we are building an interplanetary internet. And when I say that to people, they're like, why? Why are we building an interplanetary? Who are we gonna be talking to? 
Well, the answer is the world that we're building in space is very much about facilities that will need communicating with. First, let's think about it this way. Imagine Earth is going to be enveloped with an extraordinary high quality network of internet connectivity, a la Starlink, except now there'll be many competing constellations, mega constellations. So imagine that every square inch of Earth becomes a place where you can have first class internet without having to dig up anything. This will literally raise the value of every square inch on planet Earth. You will be able to work from anywhere. You will be able to track any asset anywhere on Earth. That's a game changer as well, to have really high-class high internet connectivity for all of Earth. But we're building interplanetary internet. In fact, a patent has already been awarded that turns the cell phone, the smartphone that's already in your pocket, into something that can text message someone on the moon. And then everybody goes, but I don't know anyone on the moon. And there isn't anybody there yet. Yes, that's true, but there's going to be. And the thing is, our romantic notion of an astronaut has been wonderful. And it's going to be wonderful a little bit longer, but we have to begin to move it to the side because what is coming is robotics. Imagine what is gonna happen on the moon and when it comes to asteroid mining. It's gonna be about self-assembling, self-replicating, artificial intelligence-led autonomous robotics that already we know can build buildings out of lunar moon dust. This is a world where we're gonna have factories in space. And again, a year ago, that just sounded so wild, but now we have had the first factory go up and come back. So space factories where we will be mining, refining, and producing is already a real phenomena. Now, what are we gonna be making in space? Well, the first thing that got made with the space factory from Varda were drugs. Yes, drugs in space. That's the first thing we did. Now, why? Because it turns out that zero gravity opens up a whole lot of opportunities that don't exist in gravity. So certain ingredients will bind in a zero gravity environment that won't bind in gravity, which is why all of the pharmaceutical companies have been jockeying to have experimental projects on the International Space Station. Also fiber optic cables as another great example. If you make them on earth, gravity means you get little bubbles and that slows down the speed of the transmission of the data. But if you make them in space, no gravity, no bubbles, much faster transmission of the data. And fiber optic cables, cables are not so heavy. So once we have basically a space truck, which is what the Starship is at SpaceX, and you can take stuff up and bring stuff back, well, we'll be bringing these things back to Earth. But we're already doing other things. Like, it was very interesting when OD landed on the lunar surface, what is it, a week ago, um, they interviewed the International Space Station staff, and what did they talk about? They talked about growing tissues and organs in space. They talked about being able to start creating food, sustenance, 3D printed and Petri dish grown meat. But also that same week, we heard the first surgery happened in space. And it was done from Lincoln, Nebraska remotely, thanks to whatever interplanetary internet we already have, remotely on something on the International Space Station. So now we know astronauts can be operated on in space. Now we know they can be fed potentially with supplies grown in space. And of course, we're already growing many, many plants uh, on the International Space Station. The thing that's coming that's really interesting is the production of semiconductors in space. And I personally know a number of startups, uh, Space Forge in the UK is one of them. These are not huge industrial complexes. These are small startups that are starting to construct what will be the production of semiconductors in space. Now, 
Semiconductors have obviously been a hot geopolitical topic. And we have recently moved much of the uh, chip production from Taiwan to Texas. But the next place it's going is up. And apparently when you make semiconductors in space, again, because of zero gravity, you get much higher efficiency and it's a natural clean room up there. So this is a world where we have to imagine things that sounded utterly impossible in the past and are now practically achievable. People are still focused on space as something that's about launching. Launches are exciting. They're huge, you know, they're great photo ops. It takes a huge amount of effort to lift things off of the earth and get them up there. But that's not where the game is now. We kind of know how to launch. Now we're going to reverse our focus entirely. So the next James Webb telescope probably won't be built on Earth and then lifted into space. The next James Webb telescope will be built in space. It won't be on Earth. And listening to the lawyers yesterday talking about the legal infrastructure and framework for space, they talked about where something came from. If you launched it, then this is the ownership structure. What happens if it's made in space? Then who's responsible? And by the way, everything I've described, when you talk to a regular person about this, they'll be like, wait, what about me? Where am I? I mean, I'm not going to the moon. I'm never going to be an astronaut. The answer is space is going to create untold new jobs, a huge amount of new jobs. And they will be conducted by people sitting on laptops anywhere they like, and of all age groups, in my opinion. This is not something that's exclusive to technical engineers anymore. This is going to be something where people will be operating on businesses that are in orbit or on the lunar surface or beyond, and it's going to be everybody. That's an important part of the story. So what I'm talking about are space-based solutions to most of our earthbound problems. I am talking about a world where we break the lock of energy or connectivity or resources and suddenly we have infinite possibility. Suddenly we have the real prospect of abundance. Now to do all this, you need supercomputing. Space requires an extraordinary amount of computational power. And so we are in a supercomputing race, no question about it. It's an exascale supercomputing race and it's particularly between the United States and China. It's NVIDIA versus now the most recent fastest supercomputer, the Sunway. It's hard to get a grip on where we are in that race because lots of people don't trust whether the Chinese are telling the truth about what their capabilities are. But the fact is we need to have ever more sophisticated, faster, bigger supercomputers if we're gonna get to the prizes that I've described. Quantum computing, of course, is part of that story. And why, again, do we care? It's because all of the supercomputing is literally giving humanity the opportunity to solve problems on a scale that we have never seen in the course of human history. You may be familiar with the story of the problem that was given to one of the, I think it was Frontier, uh, one of the NVIDIA supercomputers that we keep at Oak Ridge in Tennessee, because of course these are just as valuable as nuclear capability. And this is the roughly 2019 and the problem could never be solved by humans. But it turns out this supercomputer they worked out could solve it in 10,000 years, which was huge given that it was insoluble any other way. Then Google started playing around with their new Sycamore computer and quantum chips and took that same problem, it can now be solved in 200 seconds, 10,000 years to 200 seconds. That's an incredible leap in our capacity to solve any problem that we're confronted with. It also means a revolution in terms of materials. Throughout the course of human history, we've always had to start with a material, like, I don't know, a log, and then we shape it into a boat. We have to start with something and then we, we compel it to do what it is we need. 
Well, today we've gone to the other side. We can start with a need, and now we can build the material atom by atom by atom. This is a revolution, and it's not only for materials, it's for DNA and for life itself. Already, Google has announced their new AI genome because through this process, they've already discovered, I think it's 380,000 new materials humanity's never seen before. What are we gonna do with those new materials? I'm excited to see. We're gonna need new computer chips to do all of this. And that is exactly what's happening. Throughout most of our lives, computer chips have been getting smaller, 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 so they would fit in your pocket. But now we're reversing and the new AI computer chips are like the size of a dinner plate. They carry trillions of transactions, not billions of transactions anymore. This is totally revolutionizing capability. And now we're gonna bring artificial intelligence to all of this. Everybody's got an opinion on artificial intelligence. It's a very tricky subject, but bottom line is, in my opinion, people are not understanding where we're going with this. They think AI is behind a screen. You type in some question and chat GPT three, four, five gives you an answer. But that's not how Sam Altman at OpenAI sees it. What he sees is an entire AI supply chain. That means AI phones, which by the way, he's already recruited Johnny Ives, Sir Johnny Ives, who was the designer of the iPhone to build the open AI, AI phone. But it also means owning the chip production and hence they've already made investments in Cerebrus, which is making these chips the size of a dinner plate. It also means having robotics and particularly humanoid robotics. And it also means increasingly implants in humans. It also means having an energy source to power all this. And you may have seen the comments by Elon Musk just a few days ago where he said, we simply cannot power the AI that we currently have, let alone what we're building. And that's why Sam Altman started to say, I need a star on earth. And he started to invest in nuclear fusion as the beginning of this incredible, huge supply chain. That's what AI is all about. And by the way, the thing is brilliance and intelligence is distributed pretty equally throughout humanity. So there's no guarantee that all of this is going to be in America or American. And in fact, Sam Altman is going to wherever the largest data sets are, the largest pools of data, the largest large language models. And where are they? In the Middle East, in China. And that was, I think, part of what contributed to, to that strange moment where he was kind of fired on a Friday and rehired on a Monday. And why? Because maybe what nobody understood is his team, all 700 of them said, well, we're going with him and we're gonna build this AI supply chain anywhere we want, which they can. And so this is a world where these coders that are behind the construction of this new infrastructure for the build of the future, they are not tied to a particular location. They are digital nomads. And also they're gonna be less and less needed for the future because the new coding doesn't require knowledge of code. So that means we're about to have an incredible explosion in creativity where regular people can create businesses and cash flows without needing to be a coder anymore. This explosion of creativity will be global. It will be in the United States, it will be everywhere. And so let me now take you to the last piece of this story, which is new physics. And that's a challenging notion. I'm sure anybody who's a physicist is like, I already know physics, there's nothing new. But this is not the way science usually works. I love the way Richard Feynman always said, science is a way of asking questions. Well, the most extraordinary, incredible physics lab humanity has ever seen is called space. 
and we are now going into that physics lab and we're gonna be making discoveries that are absolutely mind-blowing. Literally every day, I see holes being punched in the traditional model of physics as we have new data from new sensors being processed by ever more sophisticated supercomputers led by AI. This idea that we already understand everything in physics, I just don't think it works anymore. As a small example, I had the privilege once to meet a fellow called Didier Quellos. Didier is a Frenchman who 30 years ago thought maybe there are other planets that might be not identical to Earth, but similar. And he came up with this notion of exoplanets. So he created a kind of parameter and had this hope that we might find them. And at that time, people literally thought he was insane. Like, what are you talking about? There's one Earth, there's not another one. Okay, now the James Webb telescope has gone up and it started counting the exoplanets. So I checked yesterday, where are we in the count? Which has just started, 5,640. That's interesting. And so what do we really know about what we're gonna face in space? Now I write a lot on leadership, and I have to say, one of the most poisonous, dangerous ways of thinking for anyone in a leadership position is to have certainty. Certainty is a killer. And as we go into space, I think a lot of our certainty is going to get smashed. And this is one reason I think we're hearing a whole lot more about a story that currently the Secretary of Defense finds very uncomfortable. But the reality is that the public and the top scientists of the world are using science to try to understand phenomena that has never made any sense to humanity before. Where are we going with that? I don't know. But I refuse to be certain about that because I think it will be dangerous in this new environment. Let me go a little bit further. What we're talking about is is a future where governments no longer have a monopoly on the positioning of sensors in space, of manufacturing capability in space, of physical presence in space. And so are people thinking about how to take advantage of this entirely new place to operate? I would say working with all the tech startups that I work with, definitely. And they're thinking, can I make drugs in space without having to get FDA approval? They're thinking, can I drop it in the ocean? And the answer is, yeah, actually you can do that in the future. I can tell you now, somebody is gonna put servers on the lunar surface. And when that happens, somebody's gonna say, we could create a bank. We can have a digital lunar bank. And that won't be regulated by anything on earth. Huge amounts of creative thinking are going into how can we operate in this new space space. So we also are going to have to start demarking space much more carefully. Leo and Geo is not going to be enough to help us understand where everything is going on anymore. This question of where was it built? Where is it now? This is at the heart of what you're going to need to do as lawyers defining the whole space economy. So like I said, there's an ocean of possibility and taking things from space to the ocean is definitely at the top of the mind of many of the most creative tech entrepreneurs in the world. Yesterday, there was a discussion about forum shopping and I felt the kind of attitude was, who would be doing that? And the answer is everyone, everyone. And they're looking at other governments and their policies to see what could we do over there? Anybody familiar with Cinnamon 937? Rwanda. Rwanda has applied to the ITU for the largest mega constellation of satellites in history. Something like, I think it's 320,000 of them. Are people going to Rwanda? Yes, they are. It turns out Rwanda has totally transformed their story. 
They've gone from being a country of genocide to being what is called the Singapore of Africa, the most progressive high-tech location in the emerging markets. People are definitely going to Rwanda to try to work with them because they're like, let's open this up. As a sovereign, we can have a stake in space too. And more and more countries are going to be doing this. So what I'm describing is a world where discoveries in space are going to transform the geopolitics of Earth. In fact, whole new locations need to be defined as a strategic domain. Personally, I'm very interested in an idea, which is there's a kind of lunar polar nexus between the North Pole of our Earth and the South Pole of the Moon. Why? Because this is where the satellites connect, but it's also that most of the assets we care about on the Moon are at the South Pole, the water, the helium-3, and that's where you tuck over to the dark side as well. Has anybody written about the lunar polar nexus? And what is this? And how do we define it as a strategic domain that will define the future? Now people are focused on Mars. And I know there's still a lot of kind of sniggering about, you know, this is a much harder task. But part of the reason we're going to the moon is to be able to launch without gravity. So you can go way further out into the reaches of our universe once we get to the moon. So we should think now about that lunar Mars nexus. And we need to think already about the placement of nuclear capability in space. Now, again, we've got the strategic security story. And in fact, I just saw yesterday that I think it was the head of Roscomos said that the intention is Russia will have nuclear capability on the lunar surface uh, by 2034, I think he said. And of course, China and Russia are working together. So we can't discount this possibility. We too are looking at putting nuclear capability in space, but we don't think of it as weapons. We say, no, these are just power sources. But people have different opinions about what things can be used for in the space domain. The whole concept of dual use, honestly, I'm not sure it serves us anymore. Everything is everything use. Now I wanna finish with a few thoughts that I think will carry us through in the future and then I wanna to go to questions. Space is big and it's expensive. And we think if we spend more, we'll get there first, fastest, better. But in the course of history, often it's small things that turn out to be the source of the greatest strategic advantage. How did Genghis Khan create the greatest empire in human history, even by modern standards, one of the greatest? Was it a new weapon system? No, it was the invention of a metal stirrup. And the metal stirrup allowed the archers to ride on horseback with their hands free, facing forward or facing backward. This was the incredible technological innovation that led to an empire. So we have to ask ourselves the questions today, what's the metal stirrup of our time? Personally, I think it might be a 3D printer. That might be our most strategically valuable innovation rather than any weapon system. Also, what seems to be happening is we are reversing the old Star Wars approach. So it's, my dad was, uh, he was brought in to be in charge of double checking the missile trajectories during the Cuban Missile Crisis. He was in his 20s and he was basically a walking, talking computer as they called them in those days. So he got to sit in the room with the generals and with the president during those 10 days when we were having that crisis. After that, they came up with this idea to prevent it from ever happening again, which was ultimately called by Ronald Reagan, Star Wars. And that was if we spend a dollar on a system that we say will knock an incoming ICBM out of the sky, even though we kind of know we don't have the math to do that. But if we say we can do that, that will force them to spend about $7 to keep up. And that turned out to be what was one of the major contributing factors to the end of the Soviet Union was that spend. Well, now it's kind of reversing. And so if we look, for example, at the events with Hamas, 
what were the technologies that they used? Pretty cheap Chinese toy drones helped take out the optical sensors along what is the most heavily defended and fortified wall other than maybe North Korea. And only two weeks before that event, the Iranians put up their third satellite, the North 3, the first one that could hover. So is it possible that Hamas might have had the benefit of what we would normally consider to be superpower uh, ground intelligence? Maybe. And it's cheap. And we might laugh. But actually, this stuff works. Similarly, when we look at the Chinese balloon uh, that came over the United States, and more recently, there was one um, in the news, and it was kind of tossed away as it was a hobbyist. It was a balloon at 45,000 feet. I was like, somebody ought to hire that guy, whoever that is. <laughs> well, think about it this way. Where was that balloon? It was over Wyoming and Montana. What do we have in Wyoming and Montana? I think everybody knows in this room. Now, did it need to have any weapons on it? Or did it need to just have a camera feed? And then could you take the most sophisticated facial recognition and run it over that camera feed to determine at a time when the United States is being told there's a direct nuclear threat and you want to assess, are the people on the ground, are the are the military staff on the ground of those bases, are they nervous? Are they confident? Are they hurrying? Are they going their normal speed? All of that can be done with a little camera feed and then facial recognition. This is a new way of thinking about what the future holds. Big weapon systems may not be the key to winning. Yet at the same time as these sort of slow, small balloons, come along, we also have the other extreme, hypersonics. Hypersonics are important to my mind for one critical reason, which is it compresses the decision-making time. So I remember my dad saying at one point, we got down to four hours in the Cuban Missile Crisis. And everyone was scared that we were really gonna end up in mutual assured destruction. Today, we won't have four hours, hypersonic weapons totally compress the decision-making window. We need to think about that now, and especially because hypersonics are effectively space-based weapons. The further we move into space, the more we're gonna face this compression of time issue. And as long as we're talking about nuclear weapons, I just wanted to leave you with one positive note, which is, again, something my dad realized. He said, when it comes down to it, Nobody really wants to go there. And so usually nuclear threats always end the same way. They end literally in a hug. They end with everyone embracing. And everyone goes, that's not even possible. But I remember I worked for Ronald Reagan and no one could imagine that Reagan and Gorbachev would embrace. Nobody could imagine that Nixon and Brezhnev would eat, let alone Hug. But they did. Now, I'm not saying that I can see Putin and Biden having a hug, right? I'm not. <laughs> but I am saying I could easily see their successors. And all of us in the strategic security world have to think, what are we working towards? Are we working towards a world where we want to use these weapons? Or we're working towards a world where we want to get that hug to happen? Where we want to get the peace dividend? where the whole purpose of our actions is to achieve a peace dividend. Well, I think that we're gonna have to think more about that now, and we're getting close. Ultimately, if we end up with this president or the next one, at some point, we're gonna have to reconstruct Ukraine. And honestly, we're gonna have to start thinking about the reconstruction of Russia too, because if Russia remains in its situation, which I think is a pretty bad one for its economy, we will probably continue to face the same kind of threat that we have now. China's the same. We have to really think, what is the future we want with China? Do you remember that time when Elon Musk brought out the new truck that had the indestructible glass windows? And remember, he took the baseball bat and they broke. Everybody said there's something wrong with the glass. Nothing wrong with the glass. 
it's the 20 best friends and private equity guys behind stage who said, can I hit it before you go out there? And they all, 20 guys, hit this thing. Fatigue, it cracks. Nothing wrong with the glass. It's just not designed to take multiple hits. We are about to announce sanctions on China for their support of Russia. Is it possible that we hit this thing with a baseball bat one or two, three more times and China cracks? We may have to think about how we're going to manage a world where China and Russia are cracking at the same time. Okay. What might China say in these circumstances? Because when you're really in trouble and your economy is really up the creek, which theirs is, and we're really in this incredible space race that's existential, where whoever wins is so far ahead of everyone else, there is no catch up. If you have unlimited energy, unlimited connectivity, unlimited resources, unlimited computational power, and access to new physics, what might China say? They might say, we got to the moon first. They might say, we have better AI than everyone else. We have exascale computers. We are on the moon. They may even say, we have contact with whatever new physics is starting to show us. Could that be a Sputnik moment for us? Because the world has adored the United States because of our accomplishments, because we created the nuclear weapon, because of the Trinity test, because of Los Alamos, because of NASA, because we got to the moon first. But if China can accomplish these things, everyone's gonna turn their attention in that direction. So it matters. It matters who wins this prize, who gets there first. And now we find ourselves, if we imagine that we win this race, we face exactly the same issues that have been faced in the past, but with a new set of circumstances. First, we have to understand our whole lives have been driven by the notion of scarcity. And now we're gonna face abundance. That's a whole different way of thinking. And I think this is what George Marshall faced at the end of Second World War, where he realized we won. Oh gosh, we won. How are we gonna manage the world if the others didn't win? Can we really leave the rest of humanity behind and say, it's kind of a Lord of the Rings Gollum approach and say, it's mine all mine, nobody else's. Or is this a moment when the United States has a unique opportunity in the course of human history to not just achieve these extraordinary prizes, but think about how will they be shared with the rest of the world. That's where your legal infrastructure starts to come in. And your thought process behind it, is it mine all mine or is it how can we progress humanity into a period of history where we can manage abundance? And so I'll finish with that. We're gonna take some questions, but we're in an era of moonshots and earth shots that are all succeeding. So the chances that we get there are very high. And now is the time to think, what will we do with that prize, with all those prizes? I'll finish with that and we'll take some questions. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Malmgren, uh, for, your, for your comments. And as my colleagues will be helping uh, move the microphones throughout the crowd, we do have a couple of questions from online, especially with regard to the economic impacts of the abundance that you talk about. Um, you know, if we do find ourselves in a situation where everybody becomes a quintillionaire or whatever, whatever the big number is, what are the economic controls to keep inflation from just absolutely running away? This is a great question. Um, we don't know. We've never faced this before. Uh, there are all sorts of pieces of that puzzle as well. Like, for example, Australia is one of our critical Five Eyes partners. What happens to the Australian economy if we can get the critical resources we need from space and we don't need to dig up Australia anymore? They're going to have to completely redefine their economy. I think that's one reason Australia is moving into being a space power, because they've begun to clock it will have enormous consequences for them. Just as the Saudis have registered, if this happens, 
oil and gas isn't going to be in demand in the way it was. There'll still be needs for it, but not on the scale of the past. I'm not sure that everybody in Houston is really starting to think about this. When I've talked to them, they're like, ah, oh, yeah, that'll never happen. I'm like, I'm sorry, but the best minds in the world are working on all this. And then, yeah, what happens to money and the financial system in abundant circumstances? I mean, prices are defined by scarcity. What happens when you have whatever you want, whenever you need? Power in any electricity grid, anytime, anywhere. We're going to have to totally rethink economics. So that's my answer. And as, and as folks are uh, thinking about other questions, we did have uh, another question from online as well, um, talking about, and I love, I love the comments about Svalbard, um, you know, in, in that critical infrastructure, um, is there a way that we can harden that, you know, like say, for example, you know, kind of an analog digital combination? Mm. Well, I went up to Svalbard uh, last summer to have a look, to try to understand the physicality of this location. And um, that, was extraordinary because I, you go into the harbor there and suddenly you see all these NATO ships that you, nobody's ever really even seen. There, they've only been you know, images, right? They're sitting right there. So our most sophisticated capabilities are now there and they're there for this very, very good reason. And you know, we gotta remember this is what 400, again, was it kilometers or miles away from Russia, right? It's, it's the near face-off, it's a, hotspot in geopolitics. So I think there's a kind of analog lockdown now on Svalbard. And my friends who are polar scientists based there say that pretty much every facility is all locked down. It's not a place you can go and just sort of hang out anymore. Um, it is telling that this location has become a kind of front line of our modern strategic security environment, and yet nobody has even really heard of it or knows why it's important. Again, it's part of this strange situation of what's the war we're really in? And what is the awareness the public or even our politicians have of the true nature of the situation? And even for us, what's our situational awareness of the critical nature of that location? There's a question here. I think he's screaming, yeah. Thank you so much. Linda Bishai from the Institute for Defense Analyses. Um, I want to congratulate you for telling an amazing story. I, I was gripped the entire time. Um, but I have, a, I have a lingering worry. Uh, and that is, what is the story of all of the other political entities. I think the state has not completely conceded its power and authority. Um, and I'm, I'm concerned about the ethics of the power in individual commercial actors. Uh, I'm concerned about access to all of the wonderful resources you're describing. And I'm concerned about authoritarianism um, still having control. So what happens if the US isn't the first? Um, or what happens if it's a much more multipolar race, as is entirely possible? Um, you mentioned Rwanda, and that sent a warning light off in my head as a political scientist, because Rwanda is led by President for Life, Kagame, who is not um, a kind, you know, open-minded leader. Um, so what's that story? Well, I think this is the point. Um, we have to start thinking now about the fact that space is multipolar and commercial actors will in many ways have more power and authority than government actors because they're doing the work and going out. They will be building those factories. They will be deciding what is constructed there and investors behind them. Um, so, you know, now it's a, it's a whole new picture of, we talk about non-state actors. Yeah, this could be one where the non-state actors have more power than the state actors, ultimately. Um, and certainly the competition between the superpowers is going to be at the forefront, but it's also secondary and tertiary powers. 
it's India is trying to put landers on the moon and Turkey. And by the way, Turkey recently announced they're an Arctic power. You're like, wait, what? Why are they wanting to be an Arctic power? Because the satellites connect in the Arctic, that's why. Um, so yeah, now is the time to really think very differently. You know, in financial services, which I've worked in much of my career, we, every single product comes with this disclaimer that says, past returns are no indication of future performance. We have to forget our past returns and we gotta think what could the future hold as if from scratch and stop assuming, stop assuming because we got to the moon first, we will own that space. Not true. So yeah, this is again a moment where we really have to open our minds to creative imaginal possibilities. Um, and it's hard because also we're so invested in the physical technology of the past. It's very hard to like let that go and think the key could be something really small and cheap that everything we spent all this money on might not be so useful in that new environment. But that's what happens to big corporations, right? They're all invested and then they laugh at the little startups and then the little startup comes and it eats their lunch and they don't exist anymore. So this is starting to happen in the space space. Private companies are forming at an incredible rate. rate. Um, yesterday, uh, our speaker, Vanderdunk, I forgot your first name, I'm sorry. You spoke so eloquently about Luxembourg. Lux Thank you. And uh, Luxembourg has emerged as the place for asteroid mining. Who knew? You do now. So yes, this requires a kind of new moonshot thinking. Uh, doctor, thank you so much. Um, Sergeant Hernandez with the Fort Carson uh, OSJ. Um, I want to kind of go back to where you started with the story where they cut the underseas cable um, and the cold spaces. So in addition to space, we are also learning more about how to utilize the cold spaces in the ocean on Earth, right? Expanding our utilization for data centers or other processing capabilities that on land take massive amounts of resources and energy that we can compress in the oceans. Um, so our access to these cold spaces are expanding and the cold spaces I think themselves are expanding with climate change. So I'm just kind of curious uh, what your thoughts are as we continue to expand here on earth, going more and more putting resources out there into those spaces, what are the opportunities and also the dangers as we kind of expand into the ocean as the ocean itself becomes a more viable resource to utilize? Yeah, I love this question. I think one of the, how we frame things matters. And we tend to frame things now as conflict is based on land. We have land wars because for the last couple of decades, that's what we've had. But I think we're now in naval wars and we don't know how to think about that. Also, because again, there's nobody to send the photo of undersea or even above sea naval issues. But that is where we are moving. And you're right, you know, Microsoft has already begun to introduce their uh, subsea data centers. Makes more sense because it's cold. So that's what data needs. It needs cold spaces. Um, we're already looking at data centers in space for exactly the same reason. And some strategic security discussion of placing data centers in space because they would be outside of the reach of EMP devices or nuclear events. Maybe that's one reason we're starting to hear about nuclear capability being placed in space. That, that's a driver. Um, and I do think this thinking about, now this is gonna be really challenging to say, I'm sure, but I kind of, as a person who's not in the military, I step back and I'm like, all the rivalry between the Army and the Navy and the Air Force, can we just take it to the playing field? Because there's no room for this competition amongst us anymore. We, we need to be collaborative and think creatively about what the challenges of the future will bring. We cannot be spending time on, oh, well, we should get the money because we're better than the Navy. It may be that we need the Navy to do some things because the nature of conflict and confrontation and warfare is changing. It should change. Technology will change it. And technology is moving 
as I've said, so extraordinarily fast. So yes, I think that um, we don't even really have a clear strategy for dealing with subsea cables. Uh, I just put up on LinkedIn yesterday an article by um, Grace Cassie with the Chatham House Institute in the UK, where she's talking about the incredible vulnerability. And I think there are only like six repair ships that we have. So if someone does cut a cable that doesn't have redundancy, you got to wait for one of those six ships to come to repair the thing. That's just not tenable in an era where we have subsea cables being cut all the time. So prioritization has to change. And that would be my answer. I'm sure I'm going to get ribbed about that once we get to the drinks tonight. <laughs> Dr. Mulgrain, Mark Williams, Foreign Policy Advisor at U.S. Space Command. Quick question for you about uh, the divergence between time necessary for diplomacy or negotiation and the increased speed that AI and everything you're talking about is generating. What does the future look like? Are we talking about AI-enabled diplomacy? Because it seems to me these two things are going in opposite directions in terms of confidence building measures. I think this is absolutely central. Um, speed of decision-making processes, ways of making decisions. I've been struck in recent years that we don't have a hotline with Beijing anymore. Like what? What? How is that even possible? I'm struck by the way, by the fact that we, and again, I know this is controversial territory, but you know, pilots see things, they don't know what they are, why are we firing on stuff? And we don't know what it is in a world where we are at a knife's edge with a nuclear threat. And by the way, if we are dealing with a higher intelligence, it's the way to open the conversation by shooting at it. I'm not sure. Just a question. <laughs> but I think we need to have some agreement, even when we are absolutely at odds with our opponents, about how to talk to each other in the event that things really start to get tricky. Now, again, we did that during the Cold War. My dad personally was sent to Moscow and they agreed that if it really looks like one of us is gonna hit a button or if there's an accident or if something happens, we will alert the other side to prevent an accidental es escalation. We don't have that right now. But if we could have that at the height of mutual assured destruction, there should be a possibility of having it now. Now, where does AI come into this? You know, AI is doing a lot of crazy things right now. I'm not sure we want to rely on the current AI to be making decisions on our behalf. But I do think speed of responsiveness needs to be addressed. Um, and so I don't know how we do that, but I know for sure we did it in the early 1970s. And we had provisions for things that either side wasn't sure about. Is it you? Is it something else? Let's talk. We need to have those lines of communication open again. And I think if we stop thinking about our opponents as opponents, and we think about them as these are other human beings, they have a leadership right now that we might not like or be comfortable with, but that won't last forever. By the way, I believe some foreigners might have that view about our leadership here in the United States. It's possible. So, can we find a way to talk in spite of all of that? Technology is forcing us to say, yes, we have to do it because we don't have time otherwise. Okay, thank you. And uh, thank you very much for those enlightening comments, Dr. Malmgrim. And it may not be a metal stirrup, but I hope you enjoy this uh, token of our appreciation. <laughs>